So welcome to this episode of This Cycling Life, ProBytes. Uh, today, we're delighted to be joined by Mitch Docker, uh, who's an Australian pro cyclist with EF Education First Pro Cycling. Um, but in addition to being a pro rider, of course, um, Mitch is a very successful now uh, blogger. He has Life in the Palo, and in addition to that, he's also now got special features on the Cycling Podcast, one of the most popular uh, cycling podcasts in the world. So welcome, Mitch, and of course, welcome also today our co-host, uh, Alan Davis. Welcome, Mitch. Thanks for having me, guys. Very uh, happy to be here with you guys. Terrific. So uh, what we might do, Mitch, is just jump right in. Um, and what we'd be interested, I guess, to hear from, first of all, is how and why you made this jump into to blogging and, and what has actually become a very successful transition for you into, a, I guess, another skill besides your, your cycling. I guess what happened sort of was about, about five years ago now, I was just introduced to podcasts myself and they weren't as, I'm not going to say they weren't around because they definitely were, but they definitely weren't as prominent as today. Um, and that's only five years ago, but I was listening to a couple of podcasts and I really liked the idea that when I went out riding, put my headphones in and it was like I was riding with someone else. I could just sit there and listen to someone talk and, you know, on an easy ride, it felt like I had some company there. And in the combination with that, I was continually going back to Australia and getting asked the same old questions because in Australia, I get the feeling that definitely this is sort of five years ago. Again, it's come forward a lot more in the last five years, but a lot of people still didn't really understand the life inside the Peloton, what life was like as a pro cyclist. And even to the extent of my, my close family who I thought really understood that, but even just getting simple questions like, you know, do you guys all live together in one big house? You know, how does it work with bikes? Do you get sponsored by bikes and how many bikes do you have? And I started thinking, you know what, I could actually, maybe just do a simple podcast that explains all this stuff, what life is like inside the Peloton. Hence the name of the podcast, Life in the Peloton. Um, what life, the day-to-day -day life is of a pro. And Luke Durbridge was staying at my house in Australia um, over that summer. And I thought, I don't even know how to do these things, these podcasts, whatever. So I grabbed my iPhone and just put the voice note recording on. We went up in the, the study and said, hey, look, Derbs, this is not going to be on it. I just want to test it out. You know, let's just see how this goes. And we just talked about the summer, how you get your racing program, simple stuff. And that was actually the first episode, you know, I put it straight up. I just bugger him, you know, I'm like that, that is going to go up. And what I found out over the time of doing the podcast, I thought I was doing it for everyone else, which I, which I am, but what's led me to keep doing it over the years is, I sort of get as much out of it as I think the audience do because it gives me a chance to just interview my, my colleagues, my friends, you know, even staff members and actually ask them the questions I want to ask them. When suddenly we've got the microphone on, I can feel like I can ask them those questions. I can get inside their head. And you know, even a good example is Marcel Kittle, an ex-teammate of mine. And I was with him in the beginning when he was just racing to try and win races to then when he was in quick step and onwards where he was expected to win races. And I thought, I wonder what that transition's like. How does he go with that expectation? You know, like that expectation to win. How's he gone from have a, good, have a go out there today to being at the Tour de France, Marcel? You have to win. And, you know, we get into that and I can ask him these questions. And in these interviews, I'm actually getting knowledge from my own career and my own personal experience. So that's in a nutshell what the podcast is and how it's kept going over these years uh, it's awesome mitch um definitely um you know one thing well, obviously when we were teammates back in them the orica was called green edge back in those mm. days but uh you know the podcast like you say weren't really weren't like they're, they're around today so um it was definitely as a cycling enthusiast now i'm definitely a big fan and and like you say, mate, it uh, it opens up the doors and for the for the audience to get inside the peloton, inside the teams, inside mm. the individuals to see what really makes them tick. Exactly. Yeah, it's just it's it's a simple thing, and, and that's why I have to keep reminding myself when you when you do hang out with the the cycling crowd all the time, you find yourself speaking this jargon all the time. You know, oh, I did you know Grandy's coming up, and the DS said this in the radio, and we went over this berg, and blah blah blah. But that's something I try and remind my my guests when we're on there. We're not trying to appeal to the the real diehard cycling fan. I'm trying to explain to my mum, to my grandma, 
what it is. And actually in the end, it's interesting for everyone. So rather than just excluding everyone who doesn't understand what we're talking about and appealing to 10% who do, let's keep everyone in the picture and let's just break down what we do. And actually every time I walk away from every podcast going, actually, I learn a fair bit in that, you know, it's weird. Even though I think I know the sport, every person I talk to, there's a different angle that I want to know myself that is interesting for everyone. And Rich, why um, the, the partnership with the cycling podcast? I mean, you know, clearly you're doing really well with, with Life in the Palo, growing an international followership base. And then, you know, Lionel Burney and the guys, you seem to have a good chemistry with them. How did that come about? Well, they actually came to, to me last year in the Vuelta. We're doing a little um, mini series about Marcel Kittle. He was coming to retiring and they're talking about his career and they knew that I'd had some some time with him in school Shimano, but also done the podcast. There was a bit of connection there. So we did little, little grabs there. And uh, throughout the Vuelta, they said, look, would you be interested in, we love your podcast. Would you be interested in coming on board? They were looking to add an extra segment to their, um, to their podcast. They run, you know, a few different segments as well, uh, apart from their every day, every week segment. Um, just something else to appeal to their audience. And at the time I'd sort of each year been, when I first did it, you know, I just put up a podcast whenever I had time, you know, there's one, two, there's one every week and then there was none for two months, you know? And I realized over the years that even with myself, I like consistency with podcasts, you know, you know, it comes out every week or every month or whatever it is, but you know, it's coming. And so I gathered, you know, what people probably would like to have a bit of consistency. Um, but when it's just you at the end, when it gets tough, and when you're not getting anything for it, no financial gains or anything like that, you just go, yeah, you know what, next week. But then suddenly I brought on a producer, Lara, who was helping me and things became, I wasn't, it wasn't just me anymore. I had to do it, even though she never put any pressure, someone else was involved. So that, that year we had it going every two weeks. And then the next, the natural next step was I wanted to get this a bit bigger, a bigger audience. How can I get it bigger? And then these guys asked me, would you like to come on board? And I thought, wow, this is actually the perfect step. I can, they really wanted me to keep doing exactly what I do, but bring it over to their format so their audience can get into this podcast as well. Um, so for me, it was a perfect scenario. I didn't have to change anything. Plus I could just put it out to a bigger audience um, and they can help me with the, with the technical stuff, the editing. It's not a lot of editing to do, but it was just another step that I had to do um, as well as ride a bike. So then once, once I could do that, I could just really concentrate on recording the podcast getting good guests. And actually I had another person to report to. So it's weird. It just sort of makes you be a little bit more professional. Okay. I have to have it by Wednesday. I have to have it up by then. I have to look for better guests. I have to make sure the audio is perfect. And it was just, you know, just made things a little bit more professional. I think it was, it was a nice step. Yeah. I think um, just to sort of change the topic a little bit, Mitch, uh, I definitely found myself listening to a lot more podcasts this year with the pandemic and, you know, you're living in Spain as well. Um, how has it been for you, mate, this year, you know, talking about your season, how has it, how have you gone and, you know, gone through, through this pandemic and this lockdown we had here in Spain and, and, uh, now obviously moving into now the season started again. Yeah, it was, it was a funny period. Um, as, as, as everyone's aware, um, and I went through a few little different phases. I think yeah. getting used to lockdown was hard, but then I enjoyed it weirdly. You know, like I, I had my routine. I'd get up, I'd do my Zwift at 7.30 in the morning. I was done by like nine. My whole day was free. I could hang out with the kids and do whatever. And I loved that routine in a way, in a weird kind of way. It was sort of nice. We had a house, we had enough room to do. And um, then when lockdown ended, I thought, oh, great. I'm just going to be gagging to get out on the road. I'm going to free air, whatever. I didn't enjoy it. It was so weird. It was this weird transition again of getting used to a new phase of life. Like, as going into lockdown, I didn't like it. I got I used to it and I liked it. As going out, I didn't like it. But then I got used to it and I enjoyed that. Again, the next transition was going back to racing. And it's so weird. I was aware of it. But again, I didn't enjoy it. I thought I was going to love it. But I had to go away. I'd been home for so long. And it's just change, I think, was really difficult all this time. We have a routine, as I'm almost sure you, you can say, is that you have this routine for so long in your pro career. And something I'm really aware of when I do retire, it's going to be such a shock to the system as much as you prepare yourself for it. And I don't know, you, you just can't prepare yourself for something that you're so used to doing. And all of a sudden that suitcase that's normally packed in the corner 
there'll be no need for it. You know, and you're like, fuck, when am I going away again? You know, like I, I need to get out of here. That's what we're used to. So that's what I probably struggled the most with lockdown was that change in day-to-day routine that we've had for so long. But on the flip side, and I've spoken to quite a lot of people out about this is that, you know what? There were so many cool things about lockdown. <laughs> so it's a weird thing to say, but there were so many great things about it that I had so much great quality time with. I've got two young kids, a one and a half year old, a three and a half year old. We were just, we weren't able to go to hardware stores or things like that. So you just had to create stuff from what you had at home. So inventing things out of old boxes and, you know, drawing chalk on the ground and like that was all you sort of did and you know as much as much maintenance you could do around the house obviously there was a limit to it and two months was a nice amount of time i probably wouldn't went on three four or five months but moving back into racing where we are now it's also been a hard transition and i've really enjoyed watching cycling back on tv i didn't realize how much i'd miss that um it's sort of cool to come back and in the afternoon have that lazy afternoon and watching a bit of cycling and knowing that you, you've got a race on the horizon is a nice thing too. It puts that, you know, that pressure on you to maybe, maybe not have that extra beer tomorrow or whatever because you you know, there's actually a race coming. Um, but there, again, there is that, that pressure and that's something that I probably did miss as much as I hate it sometimes. Is that pressure of racing, that pressure to perform is, that, is ultimately that reason why we do it, you know, to, to be at our best. If, it's, if there is no pressure there, it's just a training ride. You know? It's like... Once you lose that, I think once you lose, I don't know this for sure, but I get the feeling once you lose that, that nervousness, that pressure to perform, maybe that's time. You know, once you just go to a race and you just actually don't care or you don't feel nervous anymore, it's maybe a good sign. And I think when I started back at Strata Bianchi, I was, you know, for lack of a better word, shit myself. I was like, is this, is this training really going to be, am I going to be at the pointy end? And all those rides I did and, you know, am I the right weight? And I felt it again. I hated it, but I was like, ah, this is what I've missed. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting you've alluded to, I mean, these two aspects in a way and something you've experienced with, with lockdown was this, this lifestyle change, actually, which, you know, I guess so many pro riders struggle with when making that transition from being full-time athletes with all of the structure and the goals that you've mentioned and then making that shift, which is not just a career shift, shift that really is a lifestyle shift. I mean, how do you think about that, Mitch? I mean, clearly you've got quite some, potentially some years to go in your career, but what have you learned, I guess, about yourself also now that you've have stepped into this world of podcast, you know, I call it blogging, but I mean, audio blogging. Mm. Um, have you perhaps discovered or learned that there were, there were skills there, abilities there that maybe you were not aware of? Certainly when we listen to you um, on Life in the Palo, it sounds like you love doing what you do in terms of the way you speak with people. We hear your curiosity, your excitement about so many different aspects, whether it's, you know, Hanson and his incredible knowledge and experience on the tech side or training side or nutrition side. So, I mean, what have you learned about yourself besides being a bike rider, about your skills, about your talents and where that might go in the future? I guess I haven't really thought that, you know, I'm doing the podcast to do a podcast post career. You know, that's what I'm doing. I'm putting the foundations in and I want this to be blah, blah, blah. I guess probably a year or so ago, like when I brought Lara on board, there was, I started thinking about the brand life in the Peloton. I was like, life in the peloton doesn't really exist if you're not in the peloton you know i think that's a nice element of my podcast is i'm actually a pro and i'm speaking with other pros you know it's slightly different when i'm retired and you're speaking to pros it's just a different dynamic so i'm I'm aware of that after my career but i guess what i started to do was like i don't know what this brand will be life in the peloton maybe it'll be something maybe it won't be but i wanted to build this brand up as much as i could um but what i i think probably what i'm most I've learned about doing the podcast is it's just, it's challenging. You know, it's something that I, it's yes. Okay. Maybe it is easier for me to do than someone else who doesn't enjoy this, but I'm still challenged every time. And I have different guests that I'm nervous for. For instance, when I did last week, I did my, my team boss, Jonathan borders. And that's a really, it was a really interesting dynamic. You know, it might've come across that it was very easy and flowing, but 
you know, I was really nervous before that. I had to do my research and make sure I was on my game and make sure I didn't slip up or say anything wrong or still keep it feeling, you know, flowing and easy. And it's a different dynamic. And I think the first time I did someone I was really nervous about, because I've always sort of done someone I knew and off the top of my head, I could talk about something, some story. But when you go outside that realm and you talk to someone you don't really know, and the first person was for me was David Miller. Mm. And when I did David Miller, look, I knew him, but I didn't really know David. Like he was a big pro and I, yeah, I knew about him, but I never had that connection. Um, we'd say hi and have a beer maybe, but that was about it. And I, always, I wanted to ask him about his doping pass. And even though he talks about it very openly and has written stuff about it in his book, I still felt so nervous about asking him that question. And I bounced around it here and there. And the point I'm trying to get to is that I think with the podcast, what it makes me do is it, it pushes me in another area. Um, I'm pushing myself every day physically on the bike. I'm trying to push myself in the team as a leader and be a, a leader off the bike and all those elements that that creates, you know, lead by example and, you know, um, show some ownership of your decisions and different things like that. And then the third element is the podcast and, what I have to do there, even just doing research and being organized, like that's take it back to school or university. You don't do that as a pro anymore. Mm. So getting on your computer and typing up or writing in your book about some questions and thinking about the flow of the podcast. And I guess that's sort of what I'm getting out of the podcast at the moment is just another area to try and push myself as a human being, you know, like, and at the end of all this, if nothing comes from the podcast, then that's okay because I'm sure it's going to open into another area that, if I hadn't have done the podcast, I'd just be sitting still as a pro and I'd finish physically good, but who cares, you know? Um, Cause I guess you can't really use your legs after, after you're a pro, you know? No, it's, it's a very uh, interesting point, Mitch. Um, and I'd like to go into now, mate, is, you know, what we all know, obviously we just spoke about your, your, your time involved in with the life in the pillow and your commitments obviously your career, but now you have a family, mate. How do you go about juggling all this into your lifestyle now? That is difficult. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point, Albie, is that, and sometimes I do go over that limit and I notice that's like, and just even it was a really good example the other night. I was last minute trying to record a podcast because we put them up every Wednesday and I put another one up on my own feed on the other Wednesday. It's just a simple one. Talking Luft, it's called. And I wanted to, I just didn't have one organized this week. And I was trying to do Lockie Morton and he canceled out. And always, you know, as you guys would know, it's always about the guests. You want to make them feel comfortable about the time. So I was like, yeah, mate, whenever, whenever it's time. Ultimately, it got to the last minute. I had to do it. It was late at night. Blah, blah, blah. Long story short, I missed dinner, got home. My wife had to do all the kids. I'd been out training all day. And I just sort of felt like, where's the line here? You know, like you got to balance that. And that's, I, I stepped over that line that night for the podcast and that's okay once or twice, but I think I've got to be aware that not only with the family, but also with the team obligations, you know, that that is first. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be really aware of that when I go to a race, I, I pack the microphone in the bag, but it's when it fits inside the race, you know, it's not podcast first race second. Um, and that's, that comes back to also writing and that's uh, family too with, with writing is what I meant to say is that that's a transition. I'm sure you experience that when you're early in your career, it's all about writing. You go training at 11, you stop for a long brew stop. You get home at what, three or four. What do you do is have a shower, have a long lunch. Then maybe you're going to have dinner at eight or nine o'clock at night and then go to bed. Who cares? And that's okay because that's all you got to do. You can't, you can't look down on anyone like that. When you've got kids, there's a purpose, you know, and, and it very much becomes more so for me like a job. You know, I've got a certain time. I've got to fit stuff in my day. I get up with the kids at, you know, six. I'm on the bike by eight. I get back by lunchtime because I've got to get some stuff done before my son gets home. And then, you know, that's just the day. It's not, no news to anyone who works a normal job, but as a cyclist, you sort of get comfortable about living your own time. And I just had this feeling today, actually I was training with Luke Durbridge and this realization of you go through these 
processes as a pro and you start out, like I said, you start out as a young guy and you look up at all these guys, you know, the older guys and then the guys with kids and you can't quite understand why they do certain things. And a guy that I used to look up to was Brett Lancaster. I was like, never train with Brett. Like, I don't know what's, what's up his ass. He never calls me. We never call, but we're good mates. And then I'm Brett now. I've realized. It's not that I don't want to train with anyone, but I get that no one wants to train at eight in the morning. And no one wants to train five hours without stopping, you know, or just getting a real quick coffee and getting home. I'm that guy now. It's not that I don't want to do it. I don't want to, I don't want to call people because I just know that they don't want to do that. And they don't want to call me because they think that blah, blah, blah. And it's this realization that Durbo is me five years ago. And he's realizing he went to a race and he's like, I'm the old guy there now. And I'm like, yeah, hey, dude, like, welcome. You know, like, yeah. So it's just, it's a funny transition that you sort of, he's probably seeing himself as me, you know, and I'm seeing myself as Brett and, you know, he'll be, he'll be me once, once upon a time. So it's just that realization and understanding what it is and, and fitting it in and you can do it, you know, and when you're younger, you just, you can't imagine it. You're like, how could you possibly do all that stuff in a day? But you just step up and you just fit it in and you train and, you get it done. You know, like it's no news to anyone who's not a cyclist. They just look at, listen to this going and <laughs> welcome to the world, mate. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I just, while we're on topic, mate, the family, um, one thing that I noticed for or lived when I was racing was actually when you're in the race now, mate, and you know, you're a father, you're a husband. How, how has that changed for you? Do you, do you find you take the risks the way you did before? Or are you thinking, is that conscious on your mind when you're in the race? Or is it uh, like it, it's always been? I think, yeah, definitely. Like it, <clears throat> it is definitely on the mind. Um, and that's why I've tried to sort of, evo- as much as I can evolve over my career as a different rider. Um, that's a few reasons too. Like I've realized that maybe I'm just not quite as good as I was at that job. Now I'm talking about being a lead out man now, and now I'm no longer really a lead out man. And that's probably for two reasons. Maybe it was, I sort of say it's a physical ability, but maybe it wasn't. Maybe it's just purely because I wasn't able to take those risks and go through those corners and yep. do that because I was subconsciously thinking of that stuff. Um, and as you know, you've got to quickly evolve in this sport. And if you don't evolve, someone's younger, is going to take your spot and suddenly you're out of the sport. Yep. And so if you don't quickly realize that and are able to evolve into a position that needs to get filled in your team, for instance, me, uh, an older guy who can maybe get over a hill now that probably couldn't before who needs to ride the front for long periods of the time, who needs to support guys in classics. So it's a similar job, but you just have to quickly evolve into another, another rider. So they go, you know what? Oh yeah. Well, there is a use for you here now. Um, I was able to do that and still be able to do my job, but not have to get to those points where I'm like, I just, I can't do this anymore because of the risk or, but that's, it's definitely there. And I, I did notice it a few times in, actually, I really did notice it this year in San Remo. Coming back, I think it was a combination of things. We came off that new climb and my job in San Remo was to be to position now leader into the Chapressa. And this descent in before we came into uh, Imola, the town at the bottom of the climb, was really important to be in the front. You know, after that was sort of six, seven K to the bottom of the Chapressa and you just had to be in the front on this descent. And there were moments where I was like, I just have to take some risks. And the fact that I was thinking about that, I was able to do it, but I had to make a decision opposed to just doing it. And you'd know this yourself. There were times where you just, you just went to the front. You didn't even think about it. I got to get, you, I need to be at the front. I'll just do it. And I was like, I need to get to the front, <sighs> take some risks. Here we go. And I was like, whoa, I was so aware of it. And it was, it was a hard moment. And I think that was a combination of having not being in racing for so long that I was very aware of what was going on and not being in that situation. And also just being a bit older with a, with a bit more on the line, maybe. Hmm. Now, Mitch, um, you know, if you were to, uh, it's interesting how you've, you talk about having gone through these different stages of, of your career. Um, and almost talking about you and Luke Durbridge now as being the older guys, what, what advice would you give if you're meeting a, a young 19 year old guy or girl arriving from Australia to, to make it in Europe, having now spent, I guess, more than a decade 
doing what you're doing, what would be the three or four pieces of advice you would give them to, to thrive? Are you talking about someone who's just signed pro or someone still aspiring to become a professional? Just, just, just signed pro, just, just come into the pro ranks. Um, look, I think, I don't know at what point, I don't know at what point you need to make this decision, but one thing that I did early on in my career, and it was, wasn't until I moved to Spain, I lived in, in Belgium for three years. And for those first three years, I lived a little bit, I, any day it could be over type feel, you know, pretty basic furniture, you know, you just, you never really, I never really got my feet sunk in. When I finally made that, when I joined um, Green Edge, I was like, all right, this is it. Could be over in two years, I had a two-year contract, or it could be 10 years, who knows. But I, I came to the realisation then, if I don't actually make it like home here, it is going to be over in two years. Mm. And so they were just simple things like buying some furniture that was not Ikea, you know, that was a stuff that I knew I wanted to ship back. I think I actually bought a turntable and at the point that I bought a turntable and 50 records, I went, well, you know what? I'm going to get a container to go back to Australia. So that's it. I'm living here now. That was a big step for me because, and this is my advice is that you've got to make it feel like home because there's a lot of time on the road and there's, you're not at home. This is not Australia. Um, and if you don't treat it like home, Australia's going to feel a hell of a lot further away. And you're going to go in some dark places. And that's just, to be honest, everyone goes there. If you don't have a place where you can feel like home, feel like yours and escape to it, it, gets, it just gets too hard. Um, and a big, a big thing for me was having my, my wife now, well, she was my partner at the time, over here to support me too, my own little support network. Um, so my two pieces of advice so far would be make it feel like home. And secondly, set up your own support network. And that can be a few things. You know, if you don't have a partner, that's okay too. But over my career, I've been able to get people to work for me and you change teams and teams change and everything. But one thing you want to have around yourself is your own network, whether that's, and I think it's very important to have your own coach outside of the team. Whether, and also a, a psychologist or even just a mentor, someone you can talk to outside of the team, um, maybe even a nutritionist, and you can, you can keep going. But there's a few little things that you want to keep with you. So if you change from Green Edge to Astana to Rabo because it doesn't exist anymore, but you know, you've still got your core group with you who understand who you are. You're not changing coaches every team and bouncing around and whatever, and then you're lost, you know? And Finally, on, the, on that same point is that you can keep some things outside of the team. You know, if you're having a bad day or a shit time, sometimes the team doesn't need to know about that. They just need to see that you're right on race day, which could be the case. You might just go through a bad patch for three, four days, but then the race on the weekend, you're right back where you need to be. The team doesn't need to know about all that. Your guys that are helping you out need to just be there and hear, and hear you out and put things into perspective and whatever it is, you know, um, I think that's been a really key thing for me is that I've just been able to unload to my coach or to my, my mentor and also keep it separate from my home life. Um, and that, I guess the, just off the top of my head, they're, they're sort of two key parts of um, two, two points of advice that will keep you sort of longevity in the sport because it is a long game and keeping that, you keeping that sort of level head over those years is, is really important. You can go down a rabbit hole and be like, we're going to go to altitude. I'm going to die. And I'm going to do this, 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 and this. And great. You were the best man that year, but then, you know, how long is that going to last? You got to work out what works for you. You know, if that means having a, a cold beer every night, that's going to keep you happy for 10 years. Great. So be it. If that means having no alcohol ever, that's fine. You just got to work it out. What works for you really understand what, are those things that make you happy? And obviously there's too much that makes you really happy and doesn't make you perform. And there's too little that makes you unhappy and makes you perform. But you just got to balance that whole thing out and understand when the, the right times are to let your hair down and when the right times are to put the screws in. That's a really interesting point, Mitch. Um, I've had this conversation plenty of times with, with people. Um, and I'll throw into that as well you said like making it feel like home, but that's also the case for your family, right? Your partner and your kids to make it, you're the one on the road all the time, but for them, they're, they're at home 
you know, in your case in Catalonia, they really have to fit in and, and make an effort to, to, to live in that culture, right? Make that culture change and, and be happy doing it. Exactly. And this, that is a big point. Like if you're going out doing these big training rides or going on tours, there's nothing worse. Uh, not to put anything back on them, but there's nothing worse than you going away feeling like, Oh God, I hope they're okay. You know, mm. there's nothing, there's not a better feeling than just keep picking up the phone and going, how, you know, they might go, how was the race? You go, yeah, this happened, this happened. How was your day? And they go, Oh, I had a great day. And you instantly feel oh, everything's okay at home. Yeah. You know, and you can just do what you need to do because they're great at home. They're enjoying themselves. There's nothing worse than picking up the phone going, how many days till you're getting home? We're struggling here. And then you're already feeling the pressure of this race is so hard and they're struggling at home. And, you know, it's just another element. So it, I totally agree. And that comes back to exactly what you said, making a nice environment, setting up the house, whatever it is, being understanding the right place to live and, um, when I lived in Belgium, it wasn't the right place for us as a family. I personally loved Belgium. I was in the south of Belgium, down near the Ardennes. It was a brilliant place to live for training. I had a couple of cycling mates, brilliant for training. If I was just a single guy riding, I'd still be living there because it was just everything I needed. But as a situation with my wife and, and building a nice environment, it wasn't great. There was no one for her to hang out with. There was, it was pretty crap gray weather there. Um, not an interesting town or anything, but you know, as a hermit cyclist, it was like heaven. So you just got to balance that stuff up and work out at Girona or could be the right place or, you know, Italy could be the right place, but you've got to also balance that up with yourself too and make sure you don't, you know, slip into the, mm. the likes of Girona because it can be a dangerous place too of just losing your head and going down that, that way or two. Mitch, Mitch as, as an Australian married to a Flemish girl, living in Belgium, I, I can understand some of what you've said, mate, but global warming has arrived, all right? So at least the grey weather is becoming less. We, we Australians can survive here now, so that's, a, that's something you should know. Um, but Mitch Docker, th thanks a lot for your time. Um, my last question, actually, before we, before we close, and maybe some last words from Elby, the moustache and the mullet, I mean, are they here to stay? Is this, is this Mitch Docker as we're going to know him for the, for the coming 10 years, you talked about having already more than a decade in, in, in the pro, pro ranks. Is, is, is it here to stay? My old man's got a mo, and he shaved it off, I think, once, as I remember. And um, I was literally talking about this the other day. I said, oh, am I going to have a mo for the rest of my life? Because um, dad's had one. She's like, when did he get it? He's 18 when he had his mo. I was like, oh, my God. Like, I got mine when I was 29, I think. So 30, maybe. So I was just like, I don't know. Um, I do like taking it off and just changing things up. I, I don't know. Maybe when I go back to Oz, I think the mullet's probably going to suit really well. I don't know. I don't have an answer for that question. Um, I like to change things up and mix it up. Mitch, I've got a, one a little bit off topic, mate, that I know that you and I are very involved with. It's, uh, it's having a hobby that you, took, you spoke about longevity and making it easier to have a longer career. Um, Mate, you and I, we both love our NRL. Mm. Is it the year of the Parramatta Eels? We're coming into the finals, mate. Is it that year? It's looking good. I tell you what, the Eels are looking really good this year. It's, it's a shame it's such a funny year because we're not even going to get down to be able to see it. The old man has been filling me in. Yes. The Eels are looking very good. I tell you what I'm very excited about this year is that the Origin is going to be in December. Like yeah. the two, the State of Origin, the best games of the year. The season's going to be done. I'm going to be able to have a couple of cold ones, go down and watch State of Origin. So that's what I'm probably looking most forward to. But it could be the year of the Eels, you know? It, it might well be, mate. Oh, just one more. Mitch, what's, what's next for you, mate, in the, in the racing calendar? What's on the oh. horizon? Hey, guys, oh. guys, before you continue, could you, you just lost like, our entire international audience who have no idea what the NRL or an Eel is. So just, just, just for you international listeners, okay, the NRL is this violent form of <laughs> football rugby that's played National like rugby league, guys, in Australia. Where I come from down south, we don't mess with that kind of sport. But back, back to your question, Albie. Sorry about that. Yeah, sorry about that. So that's National Rugby League and it is the NRL for, for the folks that don't know. But uh, 
Yeah, Mitch, what's on the horizon, mate, for you? Um, I'm still waiting to get confirmation from our team, but I'm on, at the moment, I'm on the Giro and on the Belgium Classics. Unfortunately, those two races run at the exact same time. And earlier this year, I was on the Giro post the Classics. I'm a Classics man normally, but I, as I was explaining before, I fit into the Giro as that road captain, you know, supporting role. So, um. I actually, to be honest, I don't really know what I want at this point. I really love the classics, but I also love the Giro. So it's, it's someone make the decision for me and let me just train for it. Um, I'm waiting to hear because they, as everyone knows, the Tour de France is number one and they were just trying to get the tour done and the rest of us are waiting to hear our programs now. Yeah, no, awesome, mate. Oh, that's all from me. Thank you very much for your, for your time, bud. It's, a, it's good to have a yarn again with you, mate, and good luck with what you got on the horizon. Cheers, guys. Thanks a lot. Excellent. Thanks, Mitch. And of course, if you've liked this video, please do give us the thumbs up, uh, subscribe to This Cycling Life. And of course, go over and have a listen to Mitch's amazing podcast, Life in the Palo. Tune in to The Cycling Podcast as well, where you'll not only hear Mitch, but some great stuff from Lionel Burney uh, and the other guys. And thanks again for supporting This Cycling Life.